Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Williamsport, Pennsylvania Sabre chapter, Jimmy Sebring, George Stovey chapter in Northern Central Pennsylvania for our Zoom meeting. And uh, we kind of planned it this way at uh, this time to be right in the middle of at the end of the baseball playoffs or at the beginning of the World Series week. And uh, how fortunate we are that we're here. Uh, and I speak on behalf of all the members here in Williamsport and other guests that are joining us. And I'm speaking on behalf of Lou Hunsinger and Mark Pompeo and myself uh, in our leadership of the Williamsport Sabre group. But what better time to, to meet and greetings to everyone as we begin the 2024 World Series week. Can you believe it? This is the 12th time that the New York Yankees and the Los Angeles Dodgers are meeting in the World Series. Previously, of course, the Brooklyn Dodgers, now the Los Angeles Dodgers. I think I read it. The, it's an eight, eight wins by the Yankees, three by the Dodgers. Uh, that brings us to 11. And then now we're in the 12th game uh, between uh, these two classic teams in Major League Baseball. So we're happy to announce on this Tuesday evening, thank you for registering. Thank you for being with us. And our presenter tonight is Tony Moranti. He is a, he was, he's retired. He was a 50 year employee for the New York Yankees. Uh, Tony was the director of tours at Yankee Stadium. He's now retired. He's a Bronx historian and educator. And just in this past 2022, Tony was inducted into the New York State Baseball Hall of Fame. And so he's, I just want to add as a side light there, Tony's also a longtime uh, uh, member of the New York Botanical Gardens. And every Sunday morning at the New York Botanical Gardens in the Bronx, he has a tour that he conducts at that time. What we're looking at tonight is Tony's book. Uh, here it is. The Tony Moranti's book, Baseball, the New York Game, How the National Pastime Paralleled uh, U.S. History. And so it was published in uh, 2021. Uh, and uh, this will weave this in a little bit later, but Tony was also an adjunct professor at Fordham University in the Bronx on Fordham Road. In fact, Tony and I were co-teachers of a, a very unique course at Fordham called the History of Baseball. So Tony, let me just start off. Uh, what, what is the background of, of your book? What, what prompted you to do the research and to do the, the writing uh, for this book, uh, Baseball, the New York Game? Well, uh, first of all, thank you once again for inviting me, Jacob, uh, Jack. Um, it's an honor for me to be part of your program tonight. Uh, well, I actually started when uh, in the 2005-2006 era period, I was taking groups out to the state to the stadium, or groups were coming to me uh, from the middle schools. I got to know the teachers. I got more involved with the kids, and I eventually developed a leadership program. And I got players like Derek Jeter, Mark Teixeira, to do some public service announcements for me. And by the time 2014 came, things were growing. Uh, but what happened in 2014, when the National Assessment for Educational Progress report card came out, stating that only 18% of our eighth grade students were proficient in social studies, I was alarmed. So I uh, uh, got permission to design a program which would introduce American history through the eyes of the national pastime, which paralleled each other going back into the Revolutionary War period when General George Washington advocated leisure, exercise, and games of ball. So at that time, folk games started to develop into the uh, 19th and then the 20th centuries. Well, that was the, that was the premise that I uh, was trying to help uh, the educators uh, bring the uh, youngsters into an alternative program to help them understand American history. Thank you, Tony. Um, 
Of course, baseball is a unique game and the national pastime that's referred to among uh, many people in America and throughout the world. And uh, I know that, you know, with our research, Tony, together and everything, we were always trying to pinpoint when did baseball start? And uh, so we've come to the conclusion with many researchers is there's really no one beginning. The, the, many try to pinpoint one day or whatever, uh, but it was an evolving game. It was an, an evolving game in America, almost going back to revolutionary war years and so forth. But I, I just want to ask you this open question. How is baseball differentiated from other sports in America? Is there is there a characteristic about baseball that that uh, is unique in that way? Well, it's, uh, baseball was growing uh, when the country was uh, going through a period in the beginning of the 19th century in an agrarian society. And it started to shift over to an urbanization period. And uh, as a result of that, the organized game started to come about. And relative to your initial uh, point about the origin of the game, uh, I usually focus around 1845 when the New York Knickerbockers, which were an adjunct to the New York Gothams, who originally wrote rules governing the game. And the name of the game, the name of the rules was the New York game. So uh, 1845 with the potato famine, Manifest Destiny, which was uh, advocated by President Polk to seek everything going west of the uh, Mississippi River, uh, the game started to grow. And as we came into 19, 1849 with the gold rush, uh, the game started to move past the, the Mississippi, the Oregon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail going out to the West Coast. And some of the Knickerbockers had also gone uh, to San Francisco, opening up the San Francisco Knickerbockers. So that was basically a date that I normally use to say, well, baseball had a big push at that point in time. Now, moving forward, uh, uh, the, the second part of your question, Jack. Is it, how is baseball in the game itself, uh, uh, which uh, saber people are interested in, uh, the, they're interested in statistics, they're interested in the nature of the game, uh, the bases, the, the length of the base path. How is it unique and different from like other sports in, yeah. in America? Okay, well, most of the other sports, as you might uh, be well aware, run on clocks. They run on designated areas, whereas baseball has its own personality because all of the parks were built being uh, uh, in the days that they only had limited amounts of real estate to work with. For example, if you think about Fenway Park in Boston for uh, as a point, the uh, Lansdowne Street was the abutment of where the, the, the Green Monster is. So it's a short left field, but it has a 40 foot high fence to it. So each ballpark had its own ideal uh, circumstances. And, you know, the when other teams would come in, they had a, a different uh, idea of what they had to do to take advantage of that, uh, 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 that, that scene. So um, that's, that's, that was a major difference in that. And it's not run on a time clock. It's run on innings. Baseball games could last hours, uh, you know. So right now they're starting to cut back on that with some time clocks and intervention, but it's important. Someone said it's not over till it's over. And so that, that's, that's a, a special way of looking at the kind of the open-ended way of what baseball offers. So Tony, I'm just looking, I'm jumping up uh, to another question here that uh, that I kind of see in your book, and I want to bring this up. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, in 1942, in January of 1942, and, I, and very interestingly, this was five weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued for what people in baseball know as the green light letter. Uh, what is that? What is this green light letter Franklin Delano Roosevelt wrote in 1942? Well, um, in 1941, when the war was breaking out, Commissioner Landis was concerned about the effect it had on the game. 
So uh, he wanted to do the right thing as far as the game itself was concerned and as far as the country was concerned. So he wrote a letter to uh, President Roosevelt and uh, President Roosevelt responded with this letter that the game of baseball must go on. This was known as the green light letter. So there were a lot of ball players that did join uh, the the service, and it 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 sort of created it, it created a gap in the talent uh, that was on the field at that time. Uh, and and uh, I have to bring in a point in 1943 when Phil Wrigley of Wrigley Spearmint Gum had uh, introduced the American Association for Girl Baseball Players Professional League. And that was filling a little gap. It wasn't quite the same, but it was another form of entertainment in the game of ball. So the game of ball was growing. And now that the women had it, it lasted for about eight or nine years and and uh, sort of petered out at that point in time. But that green light letter was important uh, to for the president to say the game must go on. Thank you. That uh, an important document uh, for uh, baseball history. And so right in the 1940s, Tony, I want to jump to 1947, uh, possibly maybe the greatest fulfillment in the in baseball history and the development that happened from 1947. I, I want to say is how did 1947 affect uh, I'm, I'm using the word corporate, uh, but you, you, with a capital C or a small C, how did how did baseball become touched, as it were, and manifested as it were in 1947? Okay, we have to we have to go back to 1941 when Branch Rickey, the great foreseer of what was going on in the game, saw that the game had to uh, expand. At that point in time, it was it, it, the big, the game was segregated, so. Ricky wanted to open up the door for the uh, black personnel. And uh, he approached Landis and the, unfortunately the owners said, no, we don't want, we don't want to uh, integrate. But when, when uh, uh, he died, uh, when uh, Landis died in 1946, uh, Happy Chandler, the new commissioner said, we have to open up the game. So what happened was the, the, um, uh, introduction of Jackie Robinson through the efforts of Branch Rickey brought the brought Jackie Robinson, a great athlete, UCLA lieutenant in the Navy, also uh, came. Uh, pardon me, the Army also came to the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers through the the, the Royal the, the Royals um, minor league team, and he uh, in 1947 opened the door for the uh, for the African American people. Now, the important thing about that was that corporate America had seen how intervention was a possibility, and they started opening the doors in their executive sessions to uh, bring in more uh, African-American personnel at a higher level. So it also, baseball also had an effect because it's way before football was really that popular or baskets was just coming on the scene. So baseball had a resounding effect on Amer on corporate America at that time. And uh, the executives saw that and they, uh, they moved on it. Thank you, Tony. Well, uh, now that leads me uh, from what you just said that it leads me to the next question. But before I do the next question, I have to say this that I didn't mention about you before is that you are, a native of the Bronx. Uh, you were born in the Bronx. Uh, you were a little boy uh, running around the neighborhood of what would be Fordham University and what is Arthur Avenue, uh, the uh, the uh, little Italy section of the Bronx. Uh, and then you, know, you would be kind of running across the fields over to the Botanical Gardens. You were a graduate of the, of the famed Bishop Dubois High School. And then you entered the Navy and uh, active duty and a veteran of the United States Navy. And, but uh, so, and then eventually uh, with your employment with the New York Yankees, your dad was an usher uh, with the New York Yankees. And, and then that uh, you kind of uh, followed in the footsteps and then your career expanded from there. 
uh, with the Yankees at 161st Street. But what so what I'm bringing up is that you were a, a young person, and this was from 1947 to 1957, the golden age of baseball in New York City. And uh, what when I say that, what uh, you know, you know, give me some personal perspectives. But what what does it mean when in history books we hear about the golden age of baseball in New York City? Well, that uh, existed from 1947 to 1957 when the Giants and Dodgers go west, young man. So uh, in that 11-year period, there was only one year that either the Dodgers, Yankees, or Giants weren't involved in the World Series, and that was 1948. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, my mom came from Brooklyn. <laughs> my mom came from Brooklyn. Okay, so at holidays we would we would go to Brooklyn, and uh, sometimes as soon as I walked in the door, my uncle Tommy, the Yankees stink. What do you mean <laughs> Yankees stink? The Yankees stink. So this was I was seven eight years old at the time. By the time 1953 came, I was 11 years old, and uh, I I went out to, to Brooklyn for the holiday and. And I, my Uncle Tommy came with the same stuff. Oh, yeah, we won five consecutive World Series. We beat the Dodgers three times. And that sort of shut things up. But it, it, it was near and dear to me because right after they had left in 48, at 58, I became an usher. But what happened, why the uh, Dodgers and Giants left, even though the Dodgers had a lot of great success, uh, Milwaukee had come into the game in uh, 1953 and they outdrew the Dodgers. So O'Malley, who was looking to get a new ballpark at that time, was looking yeah. about where the Barclays Center is right now. And yeah. Moses, the great developer under President Eisenhower, said, No, we want to build, we want to build this interstate. You're in charge of the interstate. We don't want anything else going on. So Moses turned down the opportunity for O'Malley to move his team to the flatlands in Brooklyn. Uh, he said, you could go to Queens and, you know, thinking about the Queens Dodgers didn't sit well with O'Malley. So he was on a trip to uh, Japan at the time and he stopped off in Los Angeles. The mayor of Los Angeles took him around and said, Chavez Ravine, look at this. We could build you a big new ballpark. And uh, that gave him the idea so when he came back and he asked Moses once again if we could do this, and Moses said no, he says, okay, I'm gone. So to go to get permission to move the team, he had to go to Fort Frick, the president of the National League. Frick said, you ain't going to go out there by yourself. You're going to have to get somebody else to go with you. Charles Stoneham, of the giant, owner of the Giants, also wanted to leave and go to the uh, Gold Coast, so to speak. And uh, so between O'Malley and Stoneham, they were able to convince Frick that they, they were going to move uh, after the 1957 season. So that whole era was nothing, but baseball was the epicenter. Uh, New York was the epicenter of baseball, is what I'm trying to say. Tony, can you believe it that that the, the three, am I right about the three center fielders in the golden age, Willie mm -hmm. Mays, Mickey Mantle and Duke Snyder. How can that happen? How great was that? Yeah, uh, I, I'll never forget the arguments on the street corner. Uh, naturally, I was a big Mickey Mantle fan and arguing with my giant uh, friends. And we would get into some heated arguments on Mickey and Willie. Not so much the Duke, uh, but it, it was usually Willie or Mickey. But uh, uh, and be, I guess because of the proximity of the two, the two ballparks. It was only a mile of, separated by a mile over the Harlem River. And uh, the Giants were doing well at that time. They were involved in the 54 World Series. Um, but uh, I, I think that uh, at that point in time, um, uh, it, it, it was great for the game and for me to have this counteraction with my friends with these uh, three great center fielders who were in the Hall of Fame. And uh, Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, a lot of people don't realize that the polo grounds was like across the street from Yankee Stadium. I in in uh, a poetic way of saying it, across the Harlem River, and the amazing that the that the two that well the the, the polo grounds was in Manhattan, 
and then you crossed the bridge and the and the Yankees were in the Bronx. Yeah. That Tony, I still remember with our students from Fordham University after our tour of Yankee Stadium, we went over to the where the polo grounds was and it was a Kogan, what's it called? Kogan's Bluff. Remember that? The right. Uh, it's it's like a bluff. It comes down from a hill, and you can still go there where the polo grounds is and walk the steps. And as it were, coming down from Manhattan, people would walk the steps down to, uh, the, to the polo, uh, grounds. polo grounds. Yeah. So Tony, I'm skipping. Uh, before I I go to the next question, I just want to say this: is that uh, your career brought you from the the fifties into the sixties. And I know Marty Appel, the, who is a writer, he was public relations for the New York Yankees and uh, his great book on New York Yankees empire. But he often refers to you as Mickey Mantle's bodyguard. Can I say this? Is that where at the end of the Yankee games, the uh, Mantle would be in the field. But if those who attend the Yankee stadium remember the fans were allowed on the field. The fans would come on the field and they the, the in uh, they would cross the field and then the uh, the the uh, exit would be on the other side for the people on the end and they would go over thousands of fans and then out. Well Mickey Mantle had to face that and Tony you were there. You were there. Uh you were given the job at the end of the game to be there for Mickey and he would be by your side. You would take him down into the dugout. Do you remember those days? Oh, absolutely. Well, Mickey's popularity was really growing at that time. The fans had a tremendous amount of respect for him. Roger Maris had come aboard then, and people were gravitating towards what Mickey's contributions were. Uh, going to the World Series eight times out of, the, uh, out of that decade, and he was the heart and soul of the team. So as the game was ending in the top of the ninth inning, the Yankees were invariably winning. What happened was the fans were jumping out and going on the field towards the center field area out onto River Avenue. Okay. But a lot of the fans went to Mickey Mantle and they tried to, they, they jostled him. They tried to get his autograph. And once Mickey got popped, he called down for security. Uh, and they didn't have we didn't have a security detail at the time. We had ushers and the and the uh, usher wanted to get six of the fastest guys that were in. And being that I was a youngster, uh, I was one of the guys that was chosen to be on what was known as the suicide squad, where at the end of the top of the first inning, when the game was over, we would be by the dugout and we would jet out to meet Mickey by second base and escort him in. And here I am with my idol. I make you follow me. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, you know, didn't get any better than that. So that was a lot of fun and uh, uh, fond remembrances. Tony, I want to bring up the 1970s. And uh, you did write an article once, uh, just a few years ago, you wrote an article in the uh, Sabre uh, the Journal, and it was called The Turbulent 70s and the New York Yankees. But what I want to just bring up is this was the beginning. I'm just going to stay straight forward. This was the beginning of the George Steinbrenner era. Uh, this was the impact of George Steinbrenner with the Yankees and uh, with, the, the, with the city of New York. And But also, what opportunity happened to you with George Steinbrenner uh, when he entered into the Yan New York Yankees ownership? Okay, so I had begun ushering in 1958. By 1973, when Mr. Steinbrenner came into the organization in January of 60, uh, 73, he opened up a group and season sales department. And I was asked if I wanted to join the administration. So I left, I left ushering to come into the uh, administrative part of uh, the New York Yankees. And uh, through the efforts of Mr. Steinbrenner opening up this new department, um, I, uh, I, I was working there until 79 uh, when I uh, was asked to do a tour for the borough president's office. And that was something that put me into a new realm as far as my time with the New York Yankees, because I started doing tours, opened it up to the middle schools and 
and education programs followed there. And then Mr. Steinbrenner uh, gave me the opportunity to open up a department. So, uh, you know, a debt of gratitude to the boss who who uh, had the confidence in me to uh, run a department at that time. So that 70s was a turbulent year. If you remember, we had uh, police action strikes, newspaper strikes, um, a fiscal problem with the city itself. And at one point, the New, the New York Daily News had on the front page from President Ford uh, saying to New York City, drop dead, okay? Because the city was going to the government for money and they and supposedly, I think that was not an accurate article, but nevertheless, they had it on the front page. So that was also the introduction of free agency. The Yankees got back into the World Series for the first time in 15 years. Uh, and and, and uh, they won in 1977, 78. A lot of turbulence in the clubhouse, hence the term the Bronx Zoo. And it also came to a befitting end uh, uh, in 79 when their uh, beloved captain, Thurman Munson, who was the heart and soul of the team, uh, died in a plane crash in Canton, Ohio. And it was a horrible time for uh, baseball, especially here in New York. But that decade did wind up on a more solemn and and uh, spiritual note when President when uh, Pope John Paul II came to Yankee Stadium, and this was his second papal visit. Keep in mind that uh, back in 1965, Pope Paul VI came to Yankee Stadium, the first mass held in the Western Hemisphere, which opens the door to another thing. Now we're talking about Yankee Stadium and its presence in our culture. Soccer, boxing, circuses, rodeos, Negro baseball, women's professional baseball exhibition games, concerts, all came to Yankee Stadium. It was the place to go until today. And it is still at the top of our outdoor arenas in our country. So, it, it, uh, and you know, for Mr. Steinbrenner to open the door for me, um, I, I, I just felt... Uh, uh, a, a wonderful, I had a wonderful feeling about that. He gave me the opportunity. He said, you're Tony, you don't have to report to anybody. Just let me know uh, how you're doing. The tours grew. I opened it up to a Wounded Warrior Foundation. Um, and then eventually I was invited to Fordham University. Can you talk about that, Tony? Uh, well, you and I have been friends um, uh, that uh, I met you much earlier uh, I was an academic dean and a professor, and you were on the board, you were on the alumni board. I met you at a number of events, and you and I had talked, and then a number of years went by. But finally, by 2014, 2015, uh, we, uh, we put together an academic course that ne had never been uh, implemented at Fordham University, a, a, a four-credit course to uh, for students, it was interdisciplinary. Right. Uh, and we had liberal arts, we had business students. What was that experience like teaching at Fordham University? Well, to, to get me there, first of all, in 2014, that year that you just mentioned, the National Assessment for Educational Progress report came out stating that only 18% of our eighth grade students were proficient in social studies. That was alarming. So I thought it'd be a good idea to help uh, the youngsters uh, take a closer look at American history through the eyes of the national pastime, which actually paralleled each other going back to the Revolutionary War. So that was an important part. And when uh, I had the opportunity to bring it to Fordham uh, with you, Jack, that was a, a wonderful thing that happened to me to uh, partake in this school that I graduated from and yes. a place that I hung out in, in my uh, earlier days. I think that the our course um, was really the core of research for your writing of the book. And, it, and uh, as you were writing, uh, you were sending me each of the chapters. I was reviewing them, responding to you. Uh, but you had a uh, you had a great uh, from your publisher and your editors and everyone. You had a great background to to put together uh, this beautiful book about how the history 
American history parallels uh, the, uh, the baseball in America. But Tony, right now, I want to open it up uh, for our guests and our friends. And so the, is that uh, you're, right now, there are two things I want to mention to you is that you're, you're muted. Uh, and just if you want to ask a question, you know, just unmute yourself and feel free to say something. Now, there also, there's also a chat. And if you uh, push on the chat, you'll find a sidebar. Maybe you don't want to speak up to the group. But if you have a question, the, is the, feel free to put it in the chat. And then I, then I will uh, take that in order and ask Tony. So uh, Karen? Yes. Karen, yeah, good Karen Halloran, yes. Yes, I'm a retired college professor from Pittsburgh. Okay. So I taught at Pittsburgh University. But what I'm interested in, what was the most popular topic for your students as far as baseball? That's a good question. And the, uh, of course, the, um, uh, the, that our students, you know, we, we offered so much to the students and the students always surprised us, didn't they, Tony? Is what yeah. they, is we had the, the, the class was structured of team, they offered a team presentation. And so it would be two students or maybe three or four students would work um, at the, at topics. Tony, do you remember when there was a group that did uh, United States presidents attending opening days. Oh yeah, that was uh, interesting. Yeah, that was a good topic. And but the uh, the students did uh, the Black Sox series of 1919, and they did um, they, they as that attended to be 20th century topics going into the 21st century. And but I do want to say this: our course attracted uh, a lot of business students. And students took our course as a way of like looking at baseball as a business and as a professional way. And a, a number of the business students, uh, they, were, they presented topics on franchises and on the owners. A lot of good, would you say, Tony, we, there was a lot of, uh, uh, enthusiasm about those topics. Oh, the groups were great. They they did a good job collaborating with you, with each other. Nice present, great presentations in, in some cases. I uh, I thought that was a high point in getting more involvement with the students. Yeah, they and they, of course, uh, we were when we were offering the course, uh, Karen. It was in the age of the PowerPoint presentations. So <laughs> uh, you know, is that. Uh, students, uh, if you ask students to write a five-page essay, uh, they, you know, they they go out and say, "Oh, how am I going to do this?" If you ask them to put together a twenty-minute tw PowerPoint, they're that's their skill. They're they're good at media, and they and <laughs> they they were that. so they were so adept at coming up with original uh, photos and pictures. That, that were really um, amazing about that. Someone says, um, okay, uh, how's, that, how's that, Karen? Good? That was great. Thank yeah. you so much. But the one question here, Tony, is on the chat, I'm sure a common question, but one or two players over your 50 years really stood out to you in a positive way beyond the ball field. So that the in for you, over these 50 years, one or two players – that really stood out and that maybe stood out in your mind that of what happened outside the stadium, outside the ball field? Well, uh, in the 70s, when the Yankees were in a transitional period, keep in mind that they had the dog days of the 60s and coming into the 70s, Mr. Steinbrenner came into the organization. He wanted to bring the Yankees up to the top. All the boss wanted to do was win. So they started making some moves and, uh, we got a guy by the name of Lou Pinella uh, on the team. And uh, 
Lou and I uh, became friends and uh, I'll never forget the fact that uh, when he was having, when he was requested to do speaking engagements, he would call me, hey, Tony, could I get a lift over to, uh, we're going to go to Hudson, New York. And so I, I had a lot of things to do with Lou and I saw another side of him and his family in need and the kids and everything like that. Uh, I got to know Lou really well. I got to know a lot of the ball players, but when you want to pinpoint one person that had a major effect on me uh, on, on a more personal basis, it had to be Lou Pinella. Okay, very nice. And you saw, um, you saw a lot of players and developments. And um, the, the here's a good question: the uh, uh, Sean Casey, a college student here in Williamsport, he says. Have you ever brought a major leaguer to class to speak? No. Well, we came close yeah. with Ryan Rucco. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had, we didn't have, uh, uh, no, it was just Ryan that was as close to uh, a Yankee employee coming, besides Marty. Yeah. Well, Marty Appel uh, came to our class, and we had a number of speakers, we had a number of media television personalities and uh, I just want to say what well, Michael K almost made it to the class uh, Michael K of the New York Yankees wrote the introduction to Tony's book uh, but he wasn't able to come and but Ryan Rucco you know him as the voice of WNBA basketball yeah I just I, I just watched Ryan Rucco uh, for the NBA WNBA championship the other day, and he uh, he's a Fordham graduate, and uh, he he was also he also as a student worked at WFUV, uh, and so uh, but is that I'm trying to remember we had a number of speakers that that were very good. Now mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Protasio, yeah, he says yeah, I got that question. Uh, yeah, you mentioned World War II. Was that's a good. His question is: Was baseball played during World War One? Uh, yes, it was, and it it was it was the uh, watershed year of the national anthem because the uh, Boston Re uh, Fenway Park when they played the national anthem for the first time, uh, and eventually it became it, it wasn't the national anthem at that point. It was the Star Spangled Banner, and they played that for the first time before the game. And that was a sign of things to come. And by 1931, it became the national anthem and played before every home game, every game. And then eventually the other sports picked it up. So yeah. 1917, 1917. And unfortunately, uh, there was a great pitcher for the uh, uh, New York Giants at the time um, who was involved in the war and he had uh, died of mustard gas the great pitcher, uh, he, 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 Alexander, he, huh? Was it he, Alexander? Uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah. No. Uh, Grover Cleveland. He, Alexander. He, no. Matthews. Christy Matthews. Matthews. Huh? Matthewson. Christy Matthewson. Thank you very much. Thanks, great, Mark. One of the greatest pitches, and uh, he was very close to John McGraw, the feisty manager of the Giants. Unfortunately during a training exercise, he uh, absorbed some mustard gas and he died at a very young age, but uh, uh, he was also involved in the war. So there were players that did join at that time. Tony, here's a an interesting question. Uh, I think it's from Harrisburg. On July 5th, 1930, in the very first inning of the very first Negro League game in the house that Ruth built, Rap Dixon of the Baltimore Black Sox struck the first home run by an African American and what I refer to as the house that Dixon rehabbed. <laughs> have you dis have you discussed this epic home run in any stadium tours? No. All right, yeah. That, that's a good question and but uh, but I know definitely the in your tours Negro baseball was part of your um Oh, absolutely. Uh, the Negro National League was very prominent at that time. And don't forget, night baseball uh, was actually introduced by the Negro Leagues when they would take these, uh, they would actually take the stands around to different ballparks and, and, and light up the night to play games. 
Yes. So that was a very important part of night baseball. Yes. What about the, 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 I'm waiting for any other questions or if anybody wants to ask something. What about the fab in the 1990s, the fab four? And with the, maybe it might be the Derek Jeter era. But how did that, uh, oh, the core four. How did that resound in the in the Yankee organization? Well, you know, the Yankees had been struggling in 1995. They finally got into the postseason play for the first time uh, since 81, 82, like that. And um, Don Mattingly's uh, uh, watershed moment and that home run he hit, getting the Yankees one game away from going into the World Series at that time. Uh, so... Uh, Gene Michael, who was the player developer, the main player developer at that time, had uh, brought up the talent. And Bernie Williams was the first coming up in 1990 and then moving on to uh, 96, 97, 98, 99, when you had the core four. Um, Derek Jeter, um, uh, 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 what am I thinking, Derek Jeter, uh, Mariano Rivera, uh, uh, the catcher, uh, you know, th those four guys were what part of the, what was known as the core four, and yep. they brought they brought the fortune, the fame and fortune back to the New York Yankees when they won 1996, uh, 98, 99, and two thousand. So that had established a dynasty with that core four. Um, yeah, that was that was a great period. Uh, the the question here is. Have you been to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, the home of Little League Baseball, Tony? No. I wish uh, I would, been, been, I would uh, love to get there someday. I know. You've been, of course, you've been invited by me a number of times. And what is that the, the we all we discussed that you could join us at the James V. Brown Library uh, for a talk. But uh, this uh, meet, meeting with us tonight by Zoom, which which is an important mm -hmm. step for us as a chapter here in Williamsport, but, uh, but uh, someday come over, come over uh, to um, come over to be with us. True or false? Here's a question. George Costanza from Seinfeld is actually portraying the real life Tony Moranti. <laughs> I, I didn't know that one. <laughs> <laughs> and well, you know, I used to run the tours there and yeah. every once in a while, a Seinfeld fan. Seinfeld was a very popular sitcom at that time. Uh, they would, where's George Costanza's office? Where's George Costanza's office? And it was hysterical, you know. It, it, uh, it, and, and he's doing really well nowadays. Um, yeah, he's he's all over the you know commercials and stuff like that. But it, it was a very popular uh, theme at that time. Yes. So, uh, Tony. Uh, this is a, an historic week, Dodgers, Yankees, and the first two games will be in Los Angeles, and the three middle games will be at Yankee Stadium, and then the two final games, if necessary, will be in going back to Los Angeles. And so what, uh, what about the Otani? Uh, has he has he made a mark in American baseball? Absolutely, absolutely. He's he's up in that in that rarefied air, uh, along with the Judge and a few other guys. But uh, uh, he's certainly worthy of it. Uh, what he's contributed to the Dodger organization. And and, and I'm reading that the when the these Dodger playoff games now going forward is. 13 to 15 million people from Japan are watching the game uh, as the, you know, the, the, as the media uh, is moving it back to Japan for, for that. And the, so it's very interesting uh, what possibly will be this year. It'll be announced later, but that two MVPs will be playing uh, the, in the world series, the Otani and judge MVP, MVP, uh, against each other. Did you have any interaction? Uh, th this is a, a nice question. 
Did you have any interaction with our own uh, local Hall of Famer uh, from Montoursville? It's a town right next to Waynesport. Mike Musina. Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, yes, I did. I, I had some uh, interesting conversation with uh, Mike Musina, and uh, he was a big uh, advocate of the New York Times crossway puzzle. <laughs> uh, and, you know, if I would go down to the clubhouse for whatever, I would always see him sitting yeah. there and just working on a crossway puzzle. But he was a very intelligent uh, uh, guy and and, and uh, uh, he, 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 was, he was OK. He was good. And uh, from Williamsport, we were so happy um, that uh, when his eligibility came up and uh, that uh, Mike Mussina is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And so nice. So uh, we're coming up. To, we're coming up to the conclusion of our program. And the the program is recorded. To, uh, I can make this available for others, maybe as we're going along or for anyone that's here. And uh, Tony, uh, they, is that, that we have a very nice chapter here and our next meeting for our chapter is going to be December 7th, 2024 at the James V. Brown Library and a local historian a research professor historian from Penn State University, uh, Jim Quiggle, is uh, offering what's called the Cuba and the Susquehanna. Uh, in the 1944-45, is Cuban players were uh, were brought in to play minor leagues in the uh, United States, and there were players from Cuba that played on the Williamsport minor league team uh, at that time. And so th this is a, a nice original research that we're gonna have in December. And it, it, uh, kind of the theme behind that was that the Cuban players in American baseball and here in Williamsport was almost as it were a pathway that uh, along with Branch Ricky to, to open up the, to bring about the openness of, of baseball. So uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for tonight, Lou Hunsinger, Mark Pompeo, Mike Barclay, Bob. Uh, Bob, you and I met at the, you and I, yeah, yeah, you and I met uh, at, the hall, at the New York State Hall of Fame when Tony was inducted. And you, you and I met, we were there at the induction and we had breakfast the next morning. Bob uh, is a, uh, I, I do remember you, I know you, and I loved our conversation. Tom and Pat, uh, Kaz Merrick, Jamie Foster, Sean Casey, Chuck Lupert, Steve Fry, um, and uh, the uh, Rap Dixon from Harrisburg, Ted, Charlie Potasio, Anastasia, and uh, Christopher, and Jim, Jim Foran was able to, to, to link in with us, and that, that's very nice and Don Larson. So it was a nice group. And Tony, uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Someone says, thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, Jamie Foster says, Tony, thank you for your service to, to our country. God bless you. And uh, th thank you for everyone for joining us for this uh, time to be with us tonight. All right, God bless. Uh, and that's the end of our meeting. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night and enjoy the World Series Friday night. Uh, turn on the game uh, for this historic Dodgers Yankees World Series 2024. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jack.